It is Monday, October 16th, 2023. This is another edition of Football Today. You know that dude, Bobby Skinner from the Talking Giants world. I am Chris Rose, producer Mikey, along for the ride as well. Well, those 72 Dolphins popping champagne corks. Yay. No more unbeaten teams through six weeks, Bobby. Do they do they pop champagne even if it's like happens after six weeks? But I actually think Larry Zonka and them boys, they're, they're looking to pop some champagne regardless. So, yeah, I think they do. I think so, just because it's been such a huge story now for 51 years. And so it doesn't matter whether like, could you imagine if there were no um, undefeated teams after three weeks? And then do, do you celebrate after three weeks? Yeah, I think old guys like that that play in the NFL, but especially back, especially I mean, men's men, they're they're looking to celebrate and get together for anything. All right, so uh, let's start with my team, Cleveland Browns, which knocked off the Niners yesterday. San Francisco missed a forty-one yard field goal, would have given them the win in the final seconds. Instead, they lose to a third-string quarterback in PJ Walker. Uh, biggest takeaway from that game was it the Browns' defense? Was it Brock Purdy didn't look great, especially in the second half? Was it the Niners' injuries? Was it the questionable refereeing or something else? It's this Browns defense, man. And I'm I'm telling you, this Browns defense has the ability to be one of those defenses, right? And I remember you didn't want to – like on Friday's show, you're like, but it's P.J. Walker. But it's like I, I really feel like this defense is one of those defenses that carries teams to wins, even though the Browns offense is actively trying to give games away, right? Mm-hmm. Like the Browns have given up nine touchdowns. Four have been offensive drives. Two have been just tur- – uh, returns for touchdowns, two one-play drives, including yesterday following a turnover, and then a 38-yard drive following a turnover. They uh, have the fewest yards allowed through five games since 1971, the third fewest ever. I mean, I have numbers upon numbers, but this is this defense is, to me, one of those defense. If you can get this offense to average, that I'm telling you that can that can drag a team through the playoffs – and especially when the playoffs, when deep like defense wins championships is a real thing. Like it matters so much more in the playoffs to have one of these types of defenses. Yeah, I mean, listen, there was a lot of uh, internet chatter about the refereeing down the stretch and the Browns go ahead field goal drive, the Elijah Moore hit that shouldn't have been a penalty, the hold on Amari Cooper shouldn't have been a penalty. Listen, there's bad calls all the time, and we'll get to another one from the Sunday night football game that was questionable at best. Every week, there's those. And then I please don't want to hear about the Debo and Christian McCaffrey injuries, right? The Niners have been extremely healthy through the first five games, which is part of the reason, not all, but certainly part of the reason that they were unbeaten at the time. And you're certainly not going to get any sympathy from a Browns fan who is playing without their starting quarterback, without the best true running back in the league as far as running the football in Nick Chubb, without two-fifths of their offensive line in Joel Batonio and Jack Conklin, who are both pro bowlers, and uh, all pro candidates. So I'm not going to hear about the injuries. I'm not going to hear about the refereeing. That's the, that's part of football. What I am going to hear about is that this Browns defense is far and away the best uh, version of itself since it came back into the league. It's even better than when I was growing up in the 80s when they were playing in AFC championship games because I've never seen a pass rush quite like this. They're not, Bobby, you can tell me more. They're not super exotic, it feels like, with what they're doing. It's very straightforward football. And so many, I think, of these teams try and get cute. Why don't you just find the best talent up front and let it go? Yeah, and again, Schwartz does some like cool stuff on the back end. But up front, like you said, they're not throwing these crazy blitzes or anything. Like one, Miles Garrett won the battle with Trent Williams, um, even though the box score stats may not be there. He was pressuring. Uh, 54, his name is escaping me. Obo like, Okunronquo. They let him kind of run free. Like, hey, if you want to lose your gap, just go go after it. And then you have Dalvin Tomlinson and Shelby Harris and those cats in the middle. Like, they're just – and then JOK, the linebacker, he's making plays all over the field, making plays in coverage, had the sack, three tackles for a loss, a couple QB hits. Uh, and they just kind of force you to play perfect ball. And Purdy was missing. He was missing on throws, and the, the Browns made them pay – for every single one of them. And they, again, this they are the best defense in the NFL by far, right? Like, they've given up t- 10 first downs a game. Second is the Cowboys with 16. That's the difference between second and 30th. Um, 
121 passing yards per game allowed, 43 yard different, uh, diff, uh, 43 yards less than second place. Um, you know, 200 total yards per game. Second is the Ravens by 260 yards per game. Like they're just so much better. And 49ers had a great opening script. After that, they had two and a half yards per play. Mm-hmm. And again, this includes with like the Browns offense trying to give the 49ers, like, you know, they had the one play drive after the interception. And then PJ Walker almost had an interception at the end of the game. Yeah, that was a nightmare. Um, they had the I I go back and forth on like was that a fumble when they called PJ Walker like tossing the ball forward? Well, yeah, if it if they'd called it a fumble on the field, it would have stayed a fumble. That's how close it was. And I yeah. don't know, but that was on Stefanski, by the way. He he uh I I like Kevin a lot. He is extremely inconsistent on how he calls games, he really has to play to his personnel. You've got a third-string quarterback in there, and at the end of the half, he's calling timeouts when he knows that we're going to have to drive 50 or 60 yards in a minute. Like, if you're just down three, just be down three and get the ball at the beginning of the second half and just be thankful you're in it. Don't possibly have a turnover at the end of the half and give San Francisco three or seven free points because that's where you end up losing games. And this is where I want to ask you this question. Because I talked, we've talked about how great this Browns defense is, and how the offense is like actively tried to lose them and yes. has lost them games. You know, yes. Like maybe that Ravens game goes differently if they don't well, have the that Pittsburgh game. They, the Pittsburgh the, game they gave up two touchdowns off. Of yeah, the Steel, the Steelers they absolutely lost the game. So you could be four and one, mm-hmm. and maybe even five and zero. Oh, but let's the Ravens beat them fair and square. Um, even with Deshaun Watson coming back, do you think Stefanski kind of plays even though he's an offensive mind plays like hey i know what we've got on defense and we are going to be an offense that plays ball control and plays safe because this defense will get us to the playoffs and then when the playoffs come all bets are off you do you you do what you can but if they just play safe ball on offense the running game's decent and i mean they had the, the first 70 yard rusher on the 49ers defense in like 10 years like where it will get them into the dance. And I'm telling you, I really think this defense is one of those defenses that you're looking up and it's like, how the hell did they drag this team to this far? Well, like, I, don't, I hate it, to say the Super Bowl word, but like, it's, I really think this defense is that special. Yeah. It's, it's certainly that caliber. But sometimes coaches can't get out of their own way. And Stefanski's not alone in that category. And they think they have to be too cute and be smarter than everybody. And like I said, I really like Kevin. I think he's smart. I think he's a pretty decent play caller, but I think his inconsistency is, and sometimes just passing on the obvious is where guys get in trouble. So I'll just leave it at that. Um, do want to move on to the Jets. They took care of the Eagles, who were 5-0 and coming into the Meadowlands yesterday. Hurts, three picks, including one late that set up the Jets' game-winning score. So now, in case you haven't been paying attention, New York is back to 500 and free game. Aaron Rodgers throwing the football on the field. No brace, no crutches, a miracle after 34 days. So what do you think? How intrigued are you on this Jets story? I feel like Aaron Rodgers did that. So there would be these um, conversations (laughs) today. Are you saying that I got suckered into it, Bobby? I, I this Jets team, they've gotten the, like they lost those three games, right, against better teams, right? And we kind of said they they would be one and three. And then they win, they beat they but they beat the Broncos and then get an upset win versus the Eagles. Um and I actually want to talk about the Eagles a lot in this too. It's just as good as that defense is, their 32nd passing offense in the NFL. And their running game's good, but the passing game can't get them in the situations where they can run the ball. Like, so they're middle of the pack in total yards while being third in efficiency. Um, and even when they're de- like their defense got them three ter- interceptions, uh, they only scored once. And that was that. La- and then it's, let's say, if, and that was the Eagles giving them the seven points at the eight yard line. Like, I think it could have been different if, if they were trying to get a, a stop. I just, I, I would be, I would be so frustrated if I was a Jets fan, not because like, not just because the offense is bad, but because you think, man, this this team is everything I dreamed about. If Aaron Rodgers is healthy and he, he's not, he's doing Pat McAfee show and he's, okay, he's doing doing. How throws interested are you? 
don't give me the don't give me the stats. How in, are you? Are you like, yeah, they're they're fine, or are you like, man, I'm really kind of curious to see if they can get some running and maybe Rodgers becomes like a freak of nature and he's playing meaningful ball in mid December. I mean, that would take like. That would be a miracle for Rogers. So I'm not yes. I'm not interested because I don't okay. think Rogers coming back is realistic unless maybe you got to the Super Bowl, but they're not gonna get to the Super Bowl with Zach Wilson. Like um so I, I to be I'm not I'm not interested. And I think that's a shame because this was the year. This this if Aaron Rodgers is playing, we're talking about a Super Bowl contender, but he's not, and I don't think he will be this season. Yeah, I, I think, listen, a big part of this is New York, right? If it doesn't have the New York market behind it, then people are like, uh, if this team were in the middle of the country, it'd be like, oh, that's kind of a cute story. Even if it were Aaron Rodgers with the Green Bay Packers last year and they were 3-3 three and three and we saw him throwing on the field at Lambeau before, you'd be like, oh, okay, that's fine. But because it's New York, because they've got the longest drought going in NFL playoff circles and because people want them to be you know, great. And because Aaron Rodgers took a $35 million pay cut to join a new team, like it's all part of the narrative here. The fact is that defense is really good. And the fact is that they lured Jalen Hurts into some bad decisions yesterday. And yes, real quickly, I'm because I'm more interested in the Eagles than I am the Jets. I think we do spin the conversation that way. Their ground game, with the exception of one game, has been virtually invisible. Uh, we talked about it, I think, on last week's show, that even though they were 5-0, and it just felt like they hadn't played great football. And yesterday, they, that caught up with them just in time for hard-charging Miami to come pay a visit Sunday night. Well, with the the interceptions by Hurts, the first two, um, you know, the screen, and then the other one where he got hit. But the third one was really bad. Like I don't understand Terrible. what Hurts was thinking on that one. Um, and here's... I don't know how I I tried looking it up. There's no really word on it yet while we're recording this. If Lane Johnson's out, they are mm -hmm. not the Super Bowl favorite. Like Jack Driscoll came in and was very, very I mean, almost all of their negative plays were due to Jack Driscoll, right? Like a couple yeah. sacks. The hit on the second interception was Jack Driscoll. Um like it was it was a I mean, Lane Johnson hasn't given up a sack in over a season or whatever it is. And Driscoll came in and was a huge, huge downgrade. And you saw Hertz look really uncomfortable like that. And let alone just not having, you know, not just the interceptions. There just wasn't a lot of success overall on offense. Um, and they haven't looked as good as they did last year either, which is hard to match. Yeah, if I don't know how serious the Lane Johnson injury is, but that is like, that's one of those guys who you don't realize how important he is until he's gone. He's been dominant throughout his career. He's been there, I think, since 2013. Um, one other just cool little note, two things I want to say. Number one, did you feel like Sala was a little bit out of control in the post-game press conference where he said, uh, we have run a gauntlet of good teams and elite quarterbacks, and we have embarrassed every single one of them? <laughs> I think that's kind of just who Sala is. And so when you get the good moments like that, it's cool. But then when it's like when you have to deal with Zach Wilson, like when you have to deal with the negative side, it's he gets a lot of heat and people are like, well, you said stuff when it's good, say stuff when it's bad, um, which is why most coaches are just kind of non-answer most of the time. Um, so they did well versus Mahomes. They did well, very, uh, very well versus Josh Allen, Jalen Hurts. Dak um, got him. Dak played yeah. one of his better games against them. Yeah, but here's the thing: like you can puff out your chest and say we really stuck it to Mahomes, and then when he needed to, he put the dagger in, he, and he can say, "Fuck it, good, congratulations, you lured me into a couple of interceptions, and I didn't play great." And guess what? Go check out the scoreboard at the end of the day because that's what I do. I don't talk about winning. I don't talk about playing well unless we fucking won the game. Like yeah. to me, it's a little, it's a little cheesy, like to be sitting there at three and three and be like. We run the gauntlet, and we're like, come on, man. Yeah, I also think Salah realizes like I got to get this defense rallying every single week I guess. to win games. Fine, but don't say that. I don't know. Go say that in your locker room. It just seems silly when you're a 500 coach for a season and way under 500 for your career. Just I don't know. I don't get it. Anyway, um, this is kind of a cool note. 
that Quinnen and Quincy Williams are the first pair of brothers to have a takeaway in the same game on the same team in 13 years. I love Quinnen Williams. He's like one of my favorite players to watch in the NFL. Yeah, he's great. Um, I really wanted him to fall in 2019 to pick six for the Giants. Good try. Um, I, I he's he's to me he's like it's Chris Jones, Aaron Donald, and then I think Quinnen Williams is number three in the league. Yeah, if you're curious about the previous set of brothers, EJ and Aaron Henderson each had a turnover in 2010 for the Minnesota Vikings. There you go. I'm surprised Sunday the Steelers and- haven't had that yet. They have like six like sets of brothers on there. Yes, but they're they always- but they're usually flipped on opposite sides of the field too. Though that is true. That is true. Right. The previous years they had TJ and his fullback brother. This year they've got Cam and Connor Hayward. Yet again, they have. Uh, I think Herbig. They have two of them. Yes, but one of them is an offensive lineman. And then they got Joey Porter's son, Joey Porter Jr., who's half playing very well this year too. By the way, yeah, he's done okay. Sunday Night Football. Sorry, I wasn't even going to put this in the show. But then with the way the half ended and the way the game ended, I had to put it in there. So which half-ender encapsulated the game more, the first or second half? Yeah, I know that I hate talking about referees, to be honest, especially when it's a game decider. So part of me goes, okay, well, we got away with one Sunday Night Football last year versus the Commanders at the end of the game, so I can live with that. What what drives me nuts, though, going to sleep was at the end of half, Tyrod Taylor checking into a run with 14 seconds left, no timeouts, and you'd never get – and and that's the game, right? Like if, if you just kick – if you don't get a touchdown there, you kick a field goal, you're kicking a field goal to win the game at the, at the end. You're not having to throw a ball up to Darren Waller. Um, so that – the end of the first half one is, that drives me nuts. It's because like Tyrod Taylor played a very good game for a backup quarterback – but it's going to be uh, to me. I'm going to remember it for him checking out of a run when and day, you saw Dable losing his mind. He said so afterwards. Tyrod Taylor said so afterwards. It was just, it was just a very stupid decision. And again, like it didn't have some favorable front. They couldn't run the ball all night. And you you had two guys who can't block on the side that you ran into with Lawrence Cager and Darren Waller. Uh, the end of the first half, I I just. It's inexplicable. And then to see Dable's sideline outburst, like I thought his head was going to pop off. I really did. I thought it was going to overheat and just go something like that. And then, you know, I started going on Twitter just because I, for whatever, or X, and I like to live there sometimes just to see what people are saying. And a buddy of mine, um, Greg Rosenthal from NFL Network, does a very successful podcast. Was like, I like him a lot. Yeah, he's great. And he goes, Dable really loves pointing the finger. And everybody else loves pointing the finger. So I do want to play a soundbite here. This is after the game. Reporters talking to Dave all about what happened at the end of the first half. First half, did you communicate with that yeah. you couldn't run the ball on that moment? Yeah, there was, there was good commu- there was communication. Yep. So why, did, why did it happen? Why did it he just saw he saw a look based on the play that we had, and he ended up. Uh, uh, alerting it. Ended up what? Ended up alerting it to a run. Do you have a problem with how your coach handled this publicly? No, I mean Tyro's a thirty-four-year-old like veteran in the league, like, and we all knew what happened anyways because they showed like they will knew that the camera showed him losing it on Tyrod Taylor. Like, I, I guess you could protect your players in that. But I think Tyrod's big, a big enough of a is a is a grown up to be able to handle himself. And Tyrod later has said to him, you know, said to the media that, "Hey, that was on me." Mm-hmm. Um, so I, to be to be, I I don't I don't mind that, even though I do favor in the protecting your players. But that one was obvious. We saw it on the sideline. Tyrod had admitted himself too. Like Tyrod's a big boy. We're not we're not protecting like a second year QB or something. Yeah, uh, you know there were. There have been several people, including your uh, partner on Talking Giants, who showed valuable time being lost earlier in that concluding drive in the first half where Dayball could have used a timeout. There could have been, you know, a little more, let's get to it, up on the line, and that possibly cost them a few seconds, which could have been the difference between 
getting one more playoff or getting chance to kick the field goal, all that sort of stuff. So this is uh this is an entire failure, not just on a singular play. And maybe that's an area where Brian Dayball could have said after the game, hey, listen, I think I screwed up a little bit on the t- clock management as well. So while, yes, we shouldn't have checked out of that play and into a run play, there's I think this is more, this is a bigger failure. And I have to go back and look at it. And I will admit, when I go back and I, and I have time, because, I, you know, things are moving a million miles an hour. Maybe he wasn't cognizant of it, that he lost time. I suppose that's possible. But, yeah, it just felt like it was totally mismanaged the last 30 seconds. Yeah, and as someone who watches every Dable press conference, he doesn't really answer anything unless it's directly asked. And even then, most of the time, you'd be lucky if you get an answer. Mm-hmm. Um, he's like, he's, for the personality that he is, he is very, like, mute in press conferences compared to, like, last when we had Joe Judge, when he'd give you, like, a detailed explanation on everything. Um so I, I don't take too much. But, yeah, I agree that he did mismanage time at the end of the half. But I just come away from it being like, okay, but you had three shots at the end zone and you you decided to do one because for God knows reason why you thought you could check into a run. So I, I there could be, again, I agree, there could be better stuff there, but I don't mind it. And Dable's always been that way on the sideline. Like, you know, the, you saw the Jones tablet throw a couple weeks right. ago that people got on. Um, but like he did that stuff with Josh Allen too, right? Like when, like he was like Josh Allen, into, he would go get in Josh Allen's face. So, um, he is a player's coach overall, but he has those fiery moments. And I, I like that. Now it sucks that the camera has to, for him, he maybe has to come a little more away. The camera's uh, aware of everything, mm-hmm. but I like kind of getting in the guys a little bit. Interesting. What is up, football fans who may have some interest in baseball? The playoffs are here, and it's time to get in on the action. We've teamed up with DraftKings, and they are bringing all new customers an offer that you can take advantage of right now. New customers who bet $5 will get $200 in bonus bets instantly. So download the DraftKings app now and use my promo code. It's mine. Football today. One word. Only my, it's my promo code. That's right. New customers who bet just $5 on any wager will receive $200 in bonus bets instantly. Stay on the action and use your $200 in bonus bets on a DraftKings parlay. Combine multiple bets together for a shot and an even bigger payout. If sports betting is not yet available in your state, don't worry, people. You can still join in on all the fun with DraftKings Daily Fantasy and have the shot to win cash prizes. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. New customers use promo code FOOTBALL today. Bet just $5 on any wager and get $200 in bonus bets instantly. That's promo code FOOTBALL today, only at DraftKings Sportsbook. You'll be glad you did. All right. Uh, we've already talked about the Jets. Um, we've spent a lot of time on this show talking about the Cincinnati Bengals who got back to 500. They are two of several teams that improved to 3-3 three and three yesterday, along with the likes of Houston, Washington, Las Vegas, uh, the Rams. Want to ride with any of those teams the rest of the year and buy stock? No, not really. Like the only one you could, <laughs> and it's and it's because off of past performance, it's the Bengals, right? Well, I'm like not, they, they're not a part of this conversation because I think they're their own category. When you're talking about a team that is, I'm talking about teams that maybe haven't had the success of say Cincinnati Bengals. It, even the Rams are. We would. I think the Rams can be a fun. playoff team, but they're not a contender. Um. But I do want to talk one. about the Bengals, though. Like, oh, right. they, they've they got real issues offensively. Like, they're 32nd in yards. They had the 13 play and the seven point uh, seven play drive to start the game. After that, Rose, it was punt, punt, interception, punt, punt, field goal on a zero-yard drive, punt, punt, with the longest drive being 20 yards. Burrow had one pass over 20 yards, and it was an ugly interception, was 2 of 7 on 10-plus yard throws. Has the lowest average depth of target in the NFL, lowest completed air yards per attempt. They're last in total yards. That offense is broken right now. And they've shown that they can figure it out. But right now, it's they are very lucky to come out of this Seattle. They're very lucky their defense did what they did in the red zone to come out of this very victory because their offense should be two and four right now. I am going to answer my own question. And I'm going to say, let's go Texans. Let's go. 
Good for them so far. They have equaled their win total from last season. Um, They're interesting. I find them interesting. They're very watchable on offense, and that's even without a huge ground game from any particular running back this season. Here's where they've really made the biggest difference under D'Amico Ryans. They're giving up 50 fewer yards per game on the ground. That is enormous. Last year was almost 160 per game. Now, they're still over 100 this year per game on the ground, but that is a major, major step up. You can start to, like, cut those runs down from seven yards every carry to three yards. We're in business. I like that. They're giving up eight points per game less as in a total defense. And so for people who are like, man, they don't have a first-round pick next year. Dude, if you find your quarterback and your edge guy in a single draft, good good for you. Then you'll go without a first-round pick for a year. So I think they're fun to watch. And by the way, they're in a division where who knows? I mean, is it possible they get to nine wins this year? Do they have six more wins in them? I mean, they're only one. Again, it is a bad division, so you can you can see them winning the rest of their division. Like they have that ability now. So I I, I guess I am intrigued by them too. Uh, Jacksonville, even though I think are the favorite and most talented, mm-hmm. I just yes something about Jacksonville. I just don't have my full trust in them yet. Um, so yeah, I I need I want to go and watch CJ Stroud. Like really go dive deep into it because there's been some like really good stuff, and I feel like that's obviously the difference maker. Um, with them, like he's getting the most out of guys like Nico Collins, and they don't have you know Tank Dell didn't play yesterday, and again they went from the worst team in the NFL. You know, people thought they'd probably be that again, and they're three and three. Well, I know, I know we're only six weeks in, but since we are talking about if you're intrigued and if you would buy stock, I just want you to listen to this. Following the upcoming bye week, here's Houston's schedule at Carolina. Win. Home, home against Tampa Bay. Maybe. At the Bengals. Home against Arizona. Home against Jacksonville, a team they just whooped in Jacksonville by 20. Home against Denver. At the Jets. At Tennessee. Home against Cleveland, the Titans, and finish at Indianapolis. There's not one team on that schedule, not one, where you're like, man, if they don't beat the Texans, then something's seriously wrong. Wouldn't you agree? Yeah, that schedule is, like, incredibly weak. I guess that's what happens when you have a last-place schedule in the worst division in football. Yes. I mean, I got to be honest with you. The whole last-place schedule thing, that stuff's overrated, in my opinion, because it's only three games difference. It's only three games difference than the rest of your division. And, like, the Browns play a last-place schedule, but I would much rather play the New England Patriots this year than the New York Jets. That's the last-place team from the AFC East a year ago, the New York Jets. The Patriots were not the last-place team in the AFC East last year. Right. So, I don't know. Yeah, Stroud has Stroud has got them like operating well over twenty two points per game. Um, so I guess I guess you like them, but I'm I'm like I'm thinking of like contenders, like which no 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 not Super Bowl contenders, but just just a theory. even like con- like get to the conference championship type contenders where the Bengals are the only ones that have the pedigree to do it. Yeah, the Texans are pro- the Texans are probably going to be the most fun team out of them to watch. That's why I'm, I'm also watching. like the Rams with Puka Nakua and Cooper Cup. Like that could be that could get a little fun. Like they've done a great job. Yeah. So, yeah. um, and they are what? What are I guess? I guess they're all three and three. That's the yeah. That's they're the all question. three and three. That was a rub. All right. Last one before we get out of here. Week six wraps up tonight. Dallas making a second straight West Coast prime time trip. This time they'll take on the Chargers out at SoFi. Uh, Cowboys are going against their old OC and Kellen Moore. You think that's a big deal for LA's new play caller? Absolutely. Absolutely. He was there before, right? And then McCarthy comes in, big deal, who's going to call plays and more calls plays. Two years of not getting the six, actually three years of not getting the success they want. And they're like, all right, you know what the, you know what the issue is here? You. And so I absolutely think it's a big deal. 
uh, for Kellen Moore, who I'm not the biggest fan of, but I do like a lot more than I do Mike McCarthy as a play caller. Yeah, I think it's a huge deal, and I think that the Chargers are going to be designing up some crazy shit. You know how like every coach has got stuff like, oh, okay, we're not gonna we're not gonna run this in the first five games or four games, but you know we'll put something in during the bye week. I mean, you don't think that that Kellen Moore had a whole stack full of stuff for once that schedule came out and he saw the Cowboys coming to town after the bye week. He's like, hell yeah, we're going to try and do this. And oh, by the way, I think the Chargers have the highest touchdown success rate in the red zone. And the Cowboys have one of the worst. So that is a big deal. That's been a big narrative for the Cowboys. Uh, This is a huge, huge game for the Chargers on many levels. But, you know, just like I thought that the Jets probably behind closed doors um, said, hey, let's do this for Nathaniel Hackett, and they gave him the game ball after they went out to Denver and won, it wouldn't surprise me if Brandon Staley, maybe even though he doesn't have Robert Sala's personality, would use that this week with Kellen Moore. Oh, that's I, I would be shocked if the Chargers win and Kellen Moore doesn't have the game ball. And this is like a big game for these teams too, right? Like totally. the Cowboys, Huge. this is good. You lose this. You f- I think it's bigger for the loser than it is the winner. Like Chargers lose, you're under 500. Cowboys lose, you're at 500 for the first time in what probably feels like forever. Um, so I think this is this is a huge game for both of these teams. Yep. All right. Uh, always fun to break it down, look ahead, and then we'll be doing it again on Friday. Uh, can I can I say one more thing? Please do. The dog pound is so fucking sick. The noises that come out of that, like I don't know what their stadium is. The stadium's made of, but I want my stadium made of that because that noise is just ruckus and it's so loud and obnoxious, and I love every second of it. That's very kind. Um, I've never sat in the dog pound. Good reason. I I don't think I could make it out alive. <laughs> to be honest with you, I love we need to do fans. a dog pound trip. I uh, no, I'm good. I'm good where I am. I don't think I could make it. You have to stand the whole game. My back can't take that. But I love the um, passion of my home team fan base. They're they're an interesting group. They are an interesting group. They start partying in the in the Muni lot at 4 a.m. They line up there the night before. It's a lot like Kansas City. Um, they love their football, so hopefully give them a few more things to root about. But thank you for saying that. That's very kind. So uh, We are back at it again on Fridays. We'll get you all set for weekend number seven in the NFL. Thanks again to our producer, Mikey, for Bobby Skinner of Talking Giants. I'm Chris Rose. We will see you Friday on Football Today.